Okay, um, we're heading now into uh, probably the author that has um, probably put together the most comprehensive history of uh, the Baptist Church, and I, I want to go over him, uh, uh, his his background, and and what his conclusions were, and then also and also trying to. Uh, <clears throat> give you some quotes that he has in his book about the history of, of, of Baptist and, and how he documents and he cites many uh, references throughout history. Uh, tell you a little bit about the author J.M. Carl. Um, he was uh, born in Arkansas in 1858, died in 1931, so this gentleman obviously uh, is not a uh, current person, <laughs> he's he's been uh, almost two centuries older. Uh, well, at least when he was born, and so we. Yeah, but uh, he was a son of the Baptist minister, and when his family moved to Texas at age six, uh, he he later uh, was uh, converted and baptized, and he became a pastor like his father. Uh, he started this book when he was uh, at the uh, age of seventy which I'm approaching very quickly. Uh, February 15th is my 70th birthday, so that will be something I can, uh, uh, I can understand. This is, I'm considering this late in life, but he took on this project to uh, document Baptist history. Um, the purpose of the book was, uh, was to see what was truly the church that was established by Jesus Christ. So it wasn't to just document Baptist history. What he wanted to do was trace it back through all the churches, look at everything. Why do we have so many denominations? What caused that? What was going on in history? And, and so he does. He, he goes back with a pretty good uh, uh, sources and everything else to uh, document these things. Um, he had gathered many uh, uh, and studied many numerous books and documents about the origin of Christian denominations. Uh, those same books and documents were later given to the Southwest uh, Theological Seminary upon his death. So actually we have all the reference books that are in the library there at the Theological Seminary. So uh, probably felt it was important enough to, to obviously have the citations that he was referring to um, in a, in a place that probably would keep them uh, a seminary and that uh, you know people could be free to go there and document uh, especially if people were looking at well is this history true or whatever you got to actually go back to those documents that he had and, and papers um, his conclusions were that much of the history written about the church were dominated by Catholics and the churches of the Protestant Reformation Okay, um, the reason we're having this class, quite frankly, is because of that, is we don't really have a great deal, you know, when you look at Baptist church and church history, if you uh, probably take a look at it, uh, most are taking it back to maybe the 15th or 16th century, when it started to become a what I would call a more popular movement because of the Reformation churches that broke away from the Catholic Church. So what was happening uh, at the time, during this time, the history of the Baptists he discovered was written in blood, and meaning that uh, they suffered a great deal during the, uh, during the time of uh, the uh, Dark Ages in particular. And uh, so what he was, you know, that's why he wrote the book, and it's called Trail of Blood. Um, most of the history the author found was not in church records, but found in legal documents and papers of those ages. Now, why do you think they would find some Baptist history in legal in, uh, papers and documents? <clears throat> You mean as opposed to church records? Yes. <clears throat> so it wasn't skewed or biased. It was just what happened. Well, yes and no. The Baptists weren't necessarily, they were an outlier. They were a fringe group, okay, compared to what was actually the dominant belief at the time. 
uh, with Catholicism in the West and Orthodoxy in the in the Eastern uh, countries. When we're talking about Western and Eastern, if you take Rome, uh, that part of Rome going west, and look at the countries in Europe and the African North African nations, that was basically a part of Catholicism. If you go from really the uh, Slavic nations on east into Russia, those were considered the Orthodox. The, the, then we went down in the Middle East. Uh, any churches that were there were considered Orthodox or in Egypt, Coptic churches. So you have, you have this blend of even differences there uh, among those main branches of churches. So that's what we're really talking about during this period of time. And we're gonna go through why that happened. Uh, but the, they were, you know, it was sort of like uh, being in China today and having a government that was actually pursuing you for your beliefs. Well, the church was, the Roman Catholic Church in the West was definitely pursuing all people who were considered uh, heretics. Okay, and the Baptists were considered heretics by the Catholics. Um, so it was, you found it because you found in the legal documents their deaths. Okay, and why they were done, you know, uh, why they were persecuted the way they were. So they were either in the jails, prisons, um, put to death, various ways, sort of like the Spanish Inquisition that came about in Spain, similar activity going on throughout this process. Um, and I, I have there the preachers and followers were put into prisons and untold numbers were put to death by the Catholic hierarchy during the Dark Ages, which appears between 350 A.D. and 1500 A.D. Um, <clears throat> what happened in 1500 A.D.? Well, not just 15, but in the 1500s, what was really happening in the Catholic Church at that point in time? And this is what probably gave rise to Baptists becoming more of a formal organization. It was because there was a lot of dissension within the Catholic Church among Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, John Calvin, who was a Catholic priest. Um, and these they separated themselves from the Catholics and basically fought wars to defend their positions. Well, then, then when it became that way, and really it, when it came to England, uh, I'll be quite honestly, when Henry VIII separated himself because of the divorce <laughs> rules, uh, and England became the power to be. Defeated Spain, defe defeated the Catholic Empire, basically. So that's really what caused it. <clears throat> I never knew all this about the Baptists being persecuted and put to death. Um, no wonder my mother influenced us that the Catholic was the enemy. It goes back a long way. It's, it goes back a long ways. It does. It goes back a long ways. So we have um, what we call Anabaptist, which is really a part of what the Anabaptist movement was really sort of tied with the Baptist movement when it, when it came out after the Protestant Reformation. And Anabaptism, uh, people that are Anabaptists, and we're part of that, really, but there are other groups that are part of Anabaptism also, and they're not really considered Baptist at this point in time. And I'll give you Mennonites, Quakers, so on and so forth. There are groups that are believe in immersion, but are not necessarily tied to Baptist uh, belief. Uh, so again, you had a separation even among that, that group, but at the time they were generally called Anabaptist, okay? And Anabaptists were, uh, before the Reformation, basically called the Pope the Antichrist. So that's how strong that feeling was. <laughs> okay. it totally, you know, when you're called the Antichrist by, supposedly these two groups are Christian groups, and one's calling you the Antichrist, then it, you, you see how strong that feeling was because they were being persecuted. So we have then quotes <clears throat> that um, he goes through uh, from different different sources, uh, actually one is a 
a Catholic quote, uh, Cardinal Hosius uh, uh, from the Catholic in 1524, he was president of the Council of Trent, which was, an, uh, was a ca Catholic gathering uh, of import to actually determine some other new rules and regulations that they were gonna follow. Were it not that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past 1,200 years, they would swarm in greater number than all the reformers. Sort of a testimony from people that were your enemies to tell you there was a strong movement all during these periods of time of people who did not bow their knee to the Catholic Church. Okay, so that's why that persecution existed because there was a uh, there was still a strong belief that this was not the Catholic uh, uh, way was not the right way. Um, <clears throat> we have also that um, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, the Baptists are the only body of known Christians that have never symbolized with Rome. Okay, so that tells you that um, no, I'm reading that wrong. That was a, that was from a Lutheran pastor. Of, of the time, it, it, he said the 1,200 years were the uh, years preceding the Reformation, which Rome persecuted the Baptists with the most cruel and uh, persecution unthinkable. And I believe he was Baptist. Okay, he was a scientist that was, but he was also a Christian scientist who gave us many of our laws of uh, mathematics and physics. So, um, but I believe he was Baptist also. So he, he's recording that. Now, the other one, the Baptist of the uh, body known, of known Christian that never symbolized with Rome was uh, lit, written by Mosheum, who was a Lutheran. Uh, before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay secreted in almost all countries of Europe persons who had adhered ten tenaciously to the principles of modern Dutch Baptists. Okay, and that was found in uh, the Edinburgh uh, in, uh, Encyclopedia, which was a Presbyterian document, by the way. There's a quote here that, uh, to, uh, that it must have already occurred to our readers that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians uh, that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this seems to have been their leadership, leading principle from the time of Tertullian to the present. Okay, so we have uh, some quotes from some sources there that are basically either his, like historical in nature or actual quotes from people who are really would be considered non-Baptist and, and, and somewhat of a uh, uh, enmity in belief with uh, Baptists. Now, I'm going to tell you right now about if you go up and Google you'll find this is a document that is found in his book called The Trail of Blood. It's not a great, <laughs> it's, remember this is in the 1800s, this is how they graphed in the 1800s, okay? So, but he tries to document the history going from uh, AD 100 up through AD uh, 1800, okay? So, which would be, you know, his present time. And he gives, and, and probably just to let you know, uh, that that document exists out there. All you have to do is put Trail of Blood chart. You don't even have to put J.M. Carroll, but you can do that, and you'll you'll get this coming up on Google. You can actually put that on and uh, get that map. So what does it show? Uh, or, or chart. What's it show? It shows the history of the church, and basically talking about um, those that were, I'm going to just say, churches that believed in the uh, uh, in, bapt uh, in infant baptism, or, or started to put it as, and those that didn't, okay, which at, at the time they were called by different names: uh, Montanists, uh, Paulicans, uh, and then they they became known as Anabaptists. But this history starts really right around the uh, a dividing of it really starts around the period of in in 300 where uh, we'll see there's a particular event that happens in 251 uh, AD that really starts to separate and how that how that happened and then we have the uh, 
part with Constantine coming in at 300 some, 312, I think, I believe, AD in how the Roman Catholic Church got established. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to read that the first of these changes from the New Testament teachings embrace both policy and doctrine. In the first two centuries, the individual churches rapidly multiplied, and some of the earlier ones, as Jerusalem, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, grew to be very large. Jerusalem, for instance, had many thousand members, possibly 25,000 or even 50,000 is what he documents here. Now, that, obviously it's hard to find that out because no one's keeping records of membership, but they have to go from different things that may have been written at the time by church fathers and, and that type of thing. But it gives you an idea that during the first two centuries of the church, um, the reason that the Roman Empire ended up accepting Christianity as a state religion is because it was overpowering the Roman Empire, okay? It wasn't just, you know, they were trying to persecute the church and everything else, but it basically Christianity conquered paganism, okay, at that point. And so Constantine said, you know, we're going to, we're going to, there's something special. His mother was supposed to be a convert to Christianity. And so this also, all of a sudden is what happens. Uh, you know, it does take the mother sometimes <laughs> to lead the way, but that's exactly what happened um, in, in his case. And he found that, you know, the vision of the cross before he went into battle and he was successful, all of a sudden he adopts the, uh, it as a state religion. That also caused problems. Um, anyways, just to give you an idea, Christianity was really off and running in those first two centuries. And our author is really trying to document the fact that what were the beliefs in those first two centuries versus what came about later on. Um, <clears throat> he says, uh, the, uh, another vital change which seems from history to have had a beginning before the close of the second century was the, on the great doctrine of salvation itself. The Jews as well as pagans had for many generations been trained to lay great stress on ceremonials. They had become, they had come to look upon these types of anti-types or shadows of real substances and ceremonies as the real saving agencies. How easy to uh, come thus to look upon baptism. A reason thus, the Bible has much to say concerning baptism, much stress is laid upon the ordinance and one duty concerning it. Surely it must have something to do with one's salvation. So that is that it was in this period that the idea of baptismal regeneration began to get a fixed hold on some churches. Then the next error comes in, the next serious error to begin creeping in, which seems uh, from some historians not to all, but to have begun in the same century, which may be said to have been an inevitable consequence of the baptismal regeneration idea was the change in the subject of baptism since baptism has been declared to be an agency or means to salvation by some erring churches, then the sooner baptism takes place, the better. Hence arose infant baptism. Prior to this, believers and believers only were regarded as the proper subjects for baptism. Sprinkling and pouring are not referred to. These came in much later. For several centuries, infants like others were immersed. The Greek Catholics, to a very large branch of the Catholic Church, up to this day, have never changed the original form of baptism. They practice infant baptism, but have never done otherwise than immerse the children. And that's what they call dunking the children. Okay, so in other words, you have the Orthodox Church, you have the Baptist churches who are accepting, and other Anabaptist churches who are accepting the fact that baptism means to immerse. Okay, so you, you see that. So to talk about infant baptism and sprinkling is now you're, you're changing the means because you don't want the children to drown, basically. Okay, that's really what, what takes place here. And remember what I told you about the Catholic Church. The Protestant churches, when they rebelled, basically said one of their five pillars was that the sole authority 
of Scripture. The Catholic Church believes that the sole authority is the church first. Scripture has a secondary provision. Well, that allows them now to make up rules, and they're always constantly changing these rules to agree with probably what the style of the day is. Okay, because the church, the Pope, is the final authority, not the scripture. They try to reference back to the scripture, but it's not necessarily tied to, um, you know, a final authority on, on practices. So we have here what's taking place is that these churches are adopting different things and, and would go in and, and go look at, okay, now, what was happening at the time to allow this to happen? We remember Tertullian was talking about trying to tell his brothers, look, we can't do this infant baptism. It's by immersion and we shouldn't be rushing the children in. We should be waiting till they fully comprehend and then they can be baptized. So that was a difference and we had it even within the church fathers. Well. Who were the church fathers? They were nothing more than ministers of each individual church that was happening. We had no consolidation of churches. They did talk about getting together and, and reasoning what was proper, but they did not um, uh, talk about, um, you know, like, well, he's the pope, he's the leader. No, there was none of that. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let it be remembered that these changes like these were mentioned were not made in a day, not even within a year. They came about slowly and never within all the churches. Some of the churches vigorously repudiated them, so much so that in AD 251, the loyal churches declared non-fellowship for those churches who accepted and practiced these errors. Thus came about the first real official separation from among the churches. So they got together. They were called together. And when we saw, uh, you know, when certain saw uh, who believed in believer baptism versus infant baptism and all these different beliefs coming in, those churches started to, associate, started to separate, even as far back as 251 AD. Okay, so we have that happening. And so as a recap, the change from the New Testament idea of bishop and church government this change grew rapidly and more pronounced and complete. Uh, and and what, what we're talking about now is the independent church. If you look at Baptist churches, we have a lot of autonomy within each local church. That's not the same as some of your other denominations. They're very tied together. And we had a battle over here with uh, in Peters Township about the Presbyterian Church who owned it. Uh, the people that were separating who were uh, people who believed in, in scripture and those not the liberal interpretations and the denomination and the denomination took over because no we, we own it and the judge agreed with them so they had to separate themselves so this is what you have you have a denomination that hey that's our church not necessarily that local group so we have we have this type of thinking going on this is what led to Catholicism and then we had a change in the New Testament teaching as to regeneration to baptismal regeneration and then we had a change from believer's baptism to infant baptism. Those are the three real things that were happening at the time within the churches before uh, Constantine actually ever got into, uh, in, into uh, making it a part of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. But Constantine, when he came in, he declared it as a state religion, and he got together with all the churches, and all the churches that agreed basically with infant baptism and everything else were the ones that were formed the Catholic Church under Rome. That's why it's the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and at that point in time, that, that almost solidified the church and state were all together. He was the ruler of the church. <laughs> okay, he became the ruler of the church. So I just uh, wanted to see we're, we're getting close on time here. Next week, uh, probably we'll conclude this series and probably look at really what was happening to modern day, how did we get our modern day Baptist belief, even though we travel back in time to John the Baptist and Jesus, we do have a, when we became what I would call a formal movement, uh, and the differences between the Anabaptist movement and the Baptist movement, 
how it happened in England and then how it got into America. Because that's really where the Baptists thrived was in England and in America. Um, that's why you have the Southern Baptists being considered the largest denomination among uh, uh, American uh, churches that are not non Catholic. So that's it, it, it's very prevalent in America. It was prevalent in, in England, but it's uh, I think that Europeans have sort of discarded Christianity, period, now. But, anyways, that we'll go over that and conclude this whole idea of, uh, of uh, Baptist history.